following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. We actually wore these costumes on the Metro and people asked if we were going to a Renaissance Fair, but the moment we got here, everyone knew what we were doing. Are you ready? I have to keep my voice low. Students are preparing to perform on stage. Lucutio is stabbed. These students are learning Shakespeare by doing Shakespeare. In fact, that's the motto of this festival sponsored by the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. On today's show, we'll share the fun of performing Shakespeare, highlight one of the most conniving characters Shakespeare ever created, and with the help of scholar Michael Whitmore, discover the treasure of the first folio. It says, reader, look not on his picture, but his book. Don't go away. This special edition of Meet the Author begins now. Are you ready? There's no doubt that for some students, learning Shakespeare can be a chore. But what if learning Shakespeare means performing Shakespeare? How much more would students learn about the power of Shakespeare's storytelling if they dramatized words and actions? We'll try to answer this question by talking to students, as well as our special guest, Michael Whitmore, director of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Thanks for stopping by, Mike. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. The Folger makes a real effort through student uh, festivals and online teacher research to really encourage student performances. Mm -hmm. Who is William Shakespeare and why is it so, he is still so important in the study of English? William Shakespeare is one of the most important playwrights of the English Renaissance. What I think of him, what I think is important about him is the fact that he had an imagination that really could not be contained. This man imagined an entire world and he told stories about people, the kinds of people that we recognize even today. Great example of that would be Richard III, one of the great villains of uh, storytelling that we so know. So William Shakespeare is still relevant, he's still relatable. I think that's exactly right. Okay. Well, we have uh, an email. This is from mm -hmm. students at Shaw High School in Columbus, Georgia. Okay. This is what they want to know. They're watching. Mm -hmm. How did Shakespeare go about writing his plays? <laughs> That's a, great, that's a great question. We don't know exactly how he did it because he left no handwritten manuscripts of the plays that we know of as Shakespeare's plays. So we have to guess at that. But it looks to us like he had his ideas from reading, he read a lot of books, and then he put together a play, a plot. Sometimes he actually worked with others something I'll talk about a little bit okay. later. So there was collaboration there. I think a lot Certainly. of people would be surprised to know that there's no, none of his handwriting remaining. There's only, there are six signatures on legal oh. documents and there is a sheet of uh, handwriting from a play uh, called Sir Thomas More which may be Shakespeare's. How about that? Well, every year the Folger Shakespeare Library invites students to their theater to explore stagecraft and Shakespearean verse. They come prepared to perform and ask questions. Let's roll the first set of questions. Here's what they wanted to know. I was wondering what other opportunities the Folger Theater and Library has for teenagers and how we could get involved in them. To what extent, if at all, did Shakespeare's personal life influence his writing? My question is, how are Shakespeare's works still relevant today? And if so, what can we learn from them? touched on this a bit just a moment before we went to those roll-ins. How is Shakespeare still relevant? That was the third question. Yes. Well, Shakespeare tells stories that I said before are stories we can recognize. If you look at Richard III, we've got one of the great villains, someone who is mm -hmm. bent on doing evil. And a question that I ask when I look at that play is, how do you stop someone like that who is incredibly talented at deceiving people? Do you have to understand someone like that to stop him? 
And if so, how do we understand someone like that? And it would be scary to understand someone that evil, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, I think so. I think so, too. The second question was, how did Shakespeare's personal life, if at all, affect his writing? That's a great question, yeah, Della. Uh, we know that authors are always putting part of themselves into their work. Mm -hmm. But with Shakespeare, we have almost no evidence about his personal life. We have a little bit. Uh, but we really have a writer who has written about almost everything in his world. So for me, I really can't move from a play to a moment in Shakespeare's life because Shakespeare wrote about so many different things. And from my, in my opinion, it's more important to look at what Shakespeare knew than what he actually experienced. That's a good point. The, f the first student who posed a question, mm -hmm. she wrote, what o or asked, what other opportunities does the Folger Library and Theater have for teenagers? And we know there are so many. Well, you yeah. should come and visit us if you're a teenager. We've got great exhibits. We've got a terrific set of performances by our theater company. But you can also come and see a tour of our beautiful reading room. Uh, and you can get involved in other ways, like coming to our summer theater festival. So please come visit. Well, you're right. The reading room took my breath away the first time I had the opportunity to visit. It is It's an amazing beautiful. place. It really is. Yeah. Well, and speaking of that, not too long ago, you invited the MTA crew to see mm. a special book called The First Folio. Okay. If it's true that none of uh, Shakespeare's original plays exist, mm -hmm. then what is the significance of The First Folio? Tell us a little bit about it. The First Folio is probably the one book that people have spent the most time studying. Uh, it, is, it contains Shakespeare's plays from all the different genres in which mm -hmm. he wrote. It was assembled by two of his friends after he died, and it gives us the biggest picture of the plays that Shakespeare wrote and had performed. All right, we have some pictures of that, so when, while we're watching the mm -hmm. tape, if you will walk us through what we're seeing. Sure. Obviously, there's Mr. Shakespeare. So there's Mr. Yeah. Shakespeare. Yeah. That's the title page yep. uh, from the first folio with his distinctive hairdo uh, <laughs> and that giant Elizabethan ruff. The title page uh, gives way to several poems that were written to um, show off this great book. You notice that the book is actually in pretty good shape. It's 400 years old, and yet we can still touch it. Uh, here is the catalog page, and the catalog page shows you the types of plays that are actually in this collection. And Richard III was classed among Shakespeare's tragedies. This is the actual text of the page from Richard III. You notice that there are long columns with a lot of white space around them. And here is an example of early modern English and spelling. There's more than one first folio, correct? We know of 232 copies of the first folio. And we know where they're located? Those, the location okay. of those 232 is known. 82 of them are at the Folger Shakespeare Library. What a collection. Are they, are they different? Are they the same version of the same plays, or do they vary? That's a great question, Della. Every single first folio is different. And that's because while the printers were printing it, they actually corrected the plays as they were printing and they didn't throw away the uncorrected pages. So when they put them together to make a book, every single copy of the first folio is different. What about Richard III? Richard III yeah. contains differences as well. Okay. And I should mention that while we have Richard III in this beautiful collection, the first folio, there are also several smaller versions of that play that were published before the complete works or the collected works came out. So. With Richard III, it's particularly tricky because we can go to several sources for Shakespeare's language in the play, and editors have to make decisions about which ones to use. That's fascinating. Well, if you would like to join our conversation, we can be reached at 1-800-231-6359. Call in with your questions and share your favorite words of Shakespeare. For now, let's see how students prepare for a killer production of Richard III. Stay with us, we're heading for high drama. It's just a few weeks until opening night. West Potomac High's production of Richard III is in final rehearsal. The Lord upon our house. Actors will perform at their school as well as the Folger Shakespeare Library. The play, written around 1590, tracks Richard's ruthless rise to power as he seeks to become King of England. 
Historically, the story includes a real family drama between royal cousins. Known as the Wars of the Roses, the family quarrel provided Shakespeare with an opportunity to create a character, maligned and possibly misunderstood. So if you're a student and you're reading Richard III or you're an actor and you want to perform that play, there's something very interesting about that play. It has several different sources and the sources don't always agree. Scholars go and look at the different versions of these plays and say, here's how this one took shape and here's why I might want to look at this one instead. As scholars investigate the sources of a Shakespearean play, it's the job of actors to interpret the motivation of characters. As far as character building, our director, Mr. O'Grady, told me not to think of Richard as the bad guy, but to think of him as the good guy. And so that has really influenced a lot of my choices as the character and a lot of the ways that I say things. So now it's not a, an angry, I'm mad at the world, I can't be a lover, so I'm going to be a bad guy. It's more of a... Oh, yeah, well, uh, physically, because of my physical ailments, I can't be the lover, so I'm going to be the villain. It becomes a very, you know, hey, audience, this is what I'm going to do. It makes sense, right? And the audience should theoretically say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. It's really important that I am able to speak to the audience and that I'm able to successfully convey everything to them and get them on my side. Cheated of feature by dissembling nature. Deformed. Unfinished. Richard III is directed to justify his cruel deeds to the audience. As for the women of the play, they know what's up. Most of the women in the play are fully aware of what a terrible person Richard is, while most of the men are pretty oblivious, but the women, including Richard's mother, are aware that he has the worst intentions and he's a terrible person and I just hate him. I wish that I had never given birth to him. Thus his simple truth must be abused by silken, sly, insinuating jacks. Which in your outward action shows itself <coughs> against my kindred, brothers, and myself. As you've heard from Richard, he's very, very manipulative and very good at it. And um, Elizabeth is kind of described as the only character on stage who sees through it and really sees exactly how evil he is and exactly what kind of a person he is. Thine eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine. Would they were basilisks to strike thee dead. Teach not thy lips such scorn, lady. For it was made for kissing, not for such contempt. And I think that really sums it up. You know, he uses this language to just win her over completely. She says, I grew captive to his honey words. The power that he holds and the power that she could potentially hold by being with him is really, I mean, she has no other option at that point. I'll have her but I will not keep her long. It shows, which is a theme within this play, um, the power of language and how we use language to manipulate and to get others on our side. Um, and it's a tool, really. And it's the same way Shakespeare used words, you know, to win the audience over. The worm of conscience still banaw thy souls. I think that's a great line, and I love the sounds in it because it completely expresses what you're saying. You have that elongated vowel on banaw, and to be able to put so much energy behind one sound, the way that it was written, it, it totally encompasses the way she feels about Alex or Richard. So Queen Margaret is a woman with absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain. She watched her son be stabbed by several people while she begged for them to kill her too because she had lost everything. It makes you think about how ambition really isn't worth it sometimes if you have to do horrible things to get there. Many uh, people my age and younger often they think about Shakespeare and they say, oh, that's boring. That's really not the case. There's a lot, there are a lot of things about Shakespeare, like Richard III, it, it's about a guy going through and, you know, having all of these people killed. That sounds like a modern day movie, right?
I think he's right. It does sound like a modern storyline for a movie. What do you think? I think that's right. Yeah. I think if Shakespeare were alive now, mm -hmm. being a writer for film would be something he would think about. Uh, we know a lot of evil characters in film, right. like Voldemort yeah. or Darth Vader, mm -hmm. uh, larger-than-life villains. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting about Richard III is that so many people know that this guy is up to no good. For people who don't know, how would, could you summarize Richard III for us and uh -huh. tell us why it's a history? Sure. Uh, very difficult play to summarize because mm -hmm. a lot happens. But it's a play about a man who is trying to take revenge for wrongs against mm -hmm. his family. And he's absolutely ruthless. He's part of a longer conflict mm -hmm. called the War of the Roses, which was one of the great conflicts in Britain. Uh, it was kicked off, actually, by a conference that Margaret uh, was mm -hmm. part of. And it spins out over generations of English nobility. So. He gets his revenge, but he dies too. It was listed in the first folio as a tragedy. Yes. But it's a history? It, well, it's an interesting question. Is it a tragedy or is it a history? It's a history play because it talks mm -hmm. about events in English dynastic history. And Shakespeare read certain sources to get a sense of how the War of the Roses played out. He'd also written uh, several other plays about these families. So he knew it was part of a longer mm -hmm. story of real things that happened. But there's something about Richard about how charismatic he is, even though he's so evil, that makes his fall seem somewhat tragic. Okay, thank you. We sure. have a caller. Let's okay. find out what they would like to know. Okay. Hi, what is your name and what is your question today for Mike? Are you there? Hello? Yes. Is it Teen? What is your question for Mike today? I'm sorry? Do you have a question? Yes. How historically accurate is the Julius Caesar play? <laughs> well, uh, let's say that it is accurate in its basic outlines, but Shakespeare could not have known everything about what happened in uh, Roman history, and what he did is he read sources about it, and he tried to learn as much as he could. I think Shakespeare was a real improviser, and he took he had a great eye for stories and he said okay the assassination is fascinating let's tell that story and then he filled in details that he thought would make the play work better he is not always accurate historically and I think that tells us that he's a storyteller not a historian thanks that was a great question we have another caller mm -hmm. hi what is your name and question hi my name is Arnise Wade and I was wondering was Romeo and Juliet based on a true story <laughs> uh, I think Shakespeare had many examples of love and star-crossed lovers that he could take from Italian literature, from literature in English, uh, but this is a story that I think he worked up mostly uh, by himself. Beautiful story, though. Yes, it is. Thanks for calling. We're going we're going to go into an email now from uh, Mike. This is from Taylor. Okay. And Taylor wants to know, did Shakespeare have a reason or story behind each of his plays? That's a great question, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to answer. <laughs> uh, I've been reading Shakespeare for 20 years, maybe 25 years, and I still can't tell you the one reason why he wrote a play like Hamlet. I think Shakespeare probably worked for many different reasons. What he was doing was seeing into people mm -hmm. and asking himself, what would it be like to be that kind of person in that situation? And then he started writing. He, he certainly was able to look at things from just multitudes of perspectives. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You're watching a special edition of Meet the Author, Discover Shakespeare. Our guest is Mike Whitmore, director of the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. Mike, we have a couple of more questions for you. Sure. Uh, we're going to go ahead and listen to those, and then I'll give you a chance to respond when we come back. Okay. Okay. In the tragedy of Richard III, there's a character called Queen Margaret who was on the losing side of the War of the Roses, and how Shakespeare writes it, after she lost, she comes back to England, and she just kind of walks around, goes crazy, and starts cursing everyone. I was wondering what actually happened to Queen Margaret historically after she lost the war. Historically, did Richard actually arrange for the death of the two princes in the tower? Okay, 
first question she wants to know about Queen Margaret. She's what? walking around and going crazy. What really yeah. happened? Well, Margaret, uh, at the end of the Battle of Tewkesbury, mm -hmm. which is where the, the tide turns on Richard, was ransomed, uh, and she went back to France. So she lived out her life in France, but she had been a power player in English dynastic politics for a long time. Second question, did Richard III really arrange for the death <laughs> of the princes? Wouldn't we love to know? Uh, mm -hmm. There is no way to know. That's one of the great mysteries uh, of the Tower of London, and if you go and visit it, you might look at a place where the children were, well, their, their bodies uh, mm -hmm. were deposited. We don't really know if he did it, but I think Shakespeare thought it was a pretty good plot twist. I think it was, too. Oh. Okay, we have two more questions on tape. Okay. Let's listen. I wanted to know your opinion on if Shakespeare wrote all of the plays or if someone else wrote them. What can we learn outside of Shakespeare's plays by studying the text itself? Nowadays, it's very popular, whether in movies or in stage productions, um, to set Shakespeare's works in a modern setting uh, while keeping the language the same. So what do you think is the most important thing for an actor or producer or director to remember or keep in mind um, when setting Shakespeare's works in a modern uh, setting? Boy, the great questions just keep coming. I have to say, the questions are really <laughs> they, good. They really are. Okay, the first one was, and you touched on this a little yeah. bit, perhaps you can give us a little bit more insight, uh, if Shakespeare wrote all of his plays or if someone else did. Shakespeare did not write all of his plays alone. He had help from others. We know that he collaborated with other Renaissance playwrights, particularly at the end of his career. So we can see sections that we think he collaborated with someone else mm -hmm. on, or maybe someone else wrote that section. Um, there's no doubt in my mind, though, that the person who wrote the plays that we call Shakespeare's plays is the man from Stratford-upon-Avon. The second question, he wanted to know, what can we learn outside of Richard's plays studying the text itself? Hmm. Well, I'd like to combine this with the other question about putting things in a modern perspective. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about Shakespeare as a playwright is that he was really able to keep track of the words he was using. And he's drawing words from lots of different places. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'll be, oh, here's a military word. And sometimes here, this is a pol political world word. And this is from plants and natural history. If you're an actor, you should pay attention to where his words come from because they're clues about how to think about a particular scene. So if two, pe two people are in the middle of a courtship, they mm -hmm. love each other, and yet they're talking about warfare, that's a clue. Absolutely. I'm going to hold that third question for a moment because we have a caller. Okay. Let's find out what sure. they want to know. Hi, what is your name and your question today? Jacoby. Hi, what is your question for Mike? Uh, it sort of relates to the last question. Is, uh, what is your opinion on the rumor that Shakespeare did not write his own plays, but I was wondering I didn't hear the last part of your question, but I heard the beginning. It, can you repeat the question? We only heard the first part. Well, perhaps we can get him back. Let's go to the third question okay. that we sure. heard on tape. What is the most important thing that a producer, an actor, a director needs to know when they're interpreting Shakespeare in a modern setting? Yes. Well, there are a lot of different opinions on this. My opinion is that you should get out of the way and let mm -hmm. the words speak. The plays were written by someone who really understood how to put action on stage. And you can have great costumes, you can have really terrific sets, but if you lose track of the words, you're losing out on the biggest uh, event in Shakespeare. We've heard so much about the Folger Shakespeare Library on today's show. Let's take a brief tour of a capital treasure. One of the exciting things about being a research library is that we have the opportunity to bring people in and say, come and explore. Come and show us things that we've never really seen before. Underneath this building is a vault, and it's like a bank vault. It's one with dials. It takes two people to open and close it. That protects the collection that we have. We're the third largest collection in the world of early English books, that is books printed from roughly 1480 to 1640. And that's the period when print, printed books, is really taking off in Europe. Suddenly, you can actually buy a book that resembles someone else's book, and you can even carry it around with you. 
but it also manuscripts that were written by people around Shakespeare that help illuminate his life. We also have a working theater in a Tudor performance hall. We have an exhibit space where we show off our books and we interpret them for people. And we have our education program, which lets us bring these texts to life for others. So this is one of my favorite books in the collection. And I just learned about a month ago that we have this book. This is a small pocket copy of Shakespeare's poems. And this copy of Shakespeare's poems was carried in the pocket of the great American poet, Walt Whitman. And he signed this copy of his book right at the top of the page. I like this book because it shows the connection between the English Renaissance and the tradition of American lyric poetry. Whitman was carrying this book around with him as he was thinking about the world and as he was writing his poems. And it's fascinating to me that someone who was really making up the blueprint of what American poetry was going to look like had in his pocket a copy of Shakespeare. That's a direct connection between our author, Shakespeare, and the American literary tradition. You know, I've had an opportunity to visit the Folger a couple mm. of times over the last year or so, and it's such a beautiful facility, and it's such an incredible resource. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah, we have our caller back. Let's find oh, out what his okay. question is. Hi, Great. let's try it again. What is your question today? During Shakespeare's time, what did people usually wear? What did people wear? They didn't wear as much as we wear now. Uh, there's, that's a great question because there were laws about what kinds of clothes you could wear. If you were from an aristocratic family, you could wear certain kinds of clothes. If you weren't, you had to wear other kinds of clothes. And here's a nice interesting fact. The paper that books are printed on, including the first folio, comes from rags that were pulped up, rags that were once clothing. I did not know that. Thanks yeah. for your question. I did, that's very cool. I did not yeah. know that. Um, do you have a favorite passage from Shakespeare? Well, there are a lot to choose from. Yeah, there I are. do have one. <laughs> it's just a phrase. Uh, it's a phrase from Twelfth Night, a comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that a character in disguise uh, Cesario says to Olivia during their courtship, he says, I, he talks about the babbling gossip of the air. And it's a great Shakespearean metaphor by saying that there's something that is l about the air itself that wants to say the name of someone, and it's a bit like a babbling brook mm -hmm. and you hear the name. I think it's a great image. Talk to us a little bit about iambic pentameter in hmm. verse. Sure. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Iambic pentameter is the guardrail mm -hmm. that a dramatist use, mm -hmm. uses. It helps you write, po write uh, language that a, an actor can speak quickly mm -hmm. because they're used to those ryth rhythms. Uh, but it also imposes certain choices and discipline on you. Uh, so, for example, we think about uh, rap music. Now you've got to line up uh, not only the ends of the lines with rhymes, but sometimes you've got rhymes going on internally in, in a single line. Uh, Shakespeare is doing some of that. But he's also thinking about the rhythms of stressed and unstressed and how you put those things together. Mm -hmm. And all the patterns. Before you were a director of the library, you mm -hmm. were a teacher. I was. How did you introduce uh, and interject Shakespeare into your classroom? Well, I taught uh, classes that were entirely devoted to Shakespeare, and it was one of my favorite parts of my job to talk to people about Shakespeare's plays. I'll give you an example. Uh, I taught a class about Othello, one of the great tragedies. And the question that I ask my students is, what do you do when you meet the one person who can tell you the lies you really want to hear? Or the lies that you can't doubt? And that's the story of Othello, someone who meets that person who just tells him the perfect lies. How about that? Well, you know what? We're out of time already, and I sure. can't believe it. I wish we had more time, and I want to thank you for coming by and talking to us today. It was a pleasure, Della. Thanks very so much for much having fun. me. And remember, the best way to learn Shakespeare is to perform Shakespeare. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. So I'm told we're having more phone calls, so while we're waiting for those to come in, sure. uh, talk to us about technology and technology to interpret Shakespeare's work. Okay. Would you like to do that? Please. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, I'm one of those people who uses technology to interpret Shakespeare's work. I actually 
have counted many of the words in Shakespeare's plays and compared comedies to histories to tragedies and learn a lot about what Shakespeare does when he writes a comedy. I'll just give you an example. Shakespeare likes to use the words I, me, and my, and he rarely uses we in a comedy.